Will you join me in prayer this morning? Well, Lord, open thou our hearts to hear. Through thy word, to us draw near. Let us thy word air pure retain. Let us thy children and heirs remain. Amen. The word of God that's engaging us this morning is the second lesson that was read to us from Romans chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. The letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote as he was finishing his third mission journey, and he was making plans and preparations for a fourth mission journey that would take him further west than he had ever traveled. And so he wrote this letter to the far west city, the capital city of the empire, to the city of Rome, to a group of believers that had been gathering there, a group of believers, believers that largely he had not met. And he had hoped that by writing this letter, they would serve as a sponsor church for him, that they would support him, as from there, he went even further west, and so he could carry the gospel further than it had ever been all the way to Spain. But before he was going to do any of that, embark on that fourth mission journey, he was making this trip back to his homeland, a family reunion of sorts. Now Paul is from Tarsus and Cilicia, but that's where he's born, but that's not his ancestral home. His ancestral home was back in Jerusalem. That's where his family would have come from and would have traced their lineage, and actually that's where Paul spent most of his growing up years. It's there that he was trained by the greatest leaders and teachers of the faith in Judaism. It's there that he was raised up under the council of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and then later became one of the assistants of the council himself as a young man. Now, he left all that behind when he was called by Jesus and saved by grace and then sent to carry the gospel throughout the Mediterranean world, but he never lost that heart for his kinsmen, his fellows of the faith. And so as we open up to Romans chapter 9, Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself would be cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers kinsmen in the flesh. That's the first three verses of our text for today. And you can look that up in your service folder there in Romans chapter 9. Paul's concerned about his kinsmen in the flesh. We had an opportunity to do a little travel to the homeland this summer and to visit kinsmen in the flesh. Kinsmen in my wife's flesh, anyway. We went back to Iowa for a family reunion where her aunts and her uncles and her cousins and her parents and relatives, two, three times removed, I'm not sure, all descended upon a farm in western Iowa. It was a place where Iowan Iowan first farmed back in the 1890s. Now, Iowan Iowan was an immigrant, and he was my wife's great, great, great grandfather. I think I got the number of greats right in there. And, and I know that a little bit better now, because while we were at this family reunion, one of her cousins gave a presentation about the family history. Only what was really curious about that presentation is that while most families will trace their lineage and the genealogy and who was the son of who or daughter of who and who married who and follow the bloodline trace, uh, this presentation wasn't like that. Instead, he was tracing the farm, the land, and how it had been passed down and traded hands. And so he had done a lot of online research and then even gone to the county seat of that area of Iowa where we were and spent time digging through the records, the deeds and the wills that were there in the courthouse just to see how that had transitioned. And he prepared this for us, for one for each of the families who had gathered there. It is this uh, glossy booklet that has maps in it from different time periods of that area of Iowa and on the map showing who owned what land and when. And then it has a timeline in here with the actual legal documentation and written language of every time some of that land changed hands and whose hand it went to so that we could see when property made it into the to the farms of the Iowa, Iowa descendants and how long they farmed it before it was passed on from generation to generation. Now, about 120 years after that time period, there is still one of Jen's mother's cousins who is living on some of that ancestral farmland and farming it and still living in one of those ancestral homes. Although, 
reading this, when we got back, we had to realize that it doesn't really transfer from generation to generation, not like you might think, just father to son. Because some of that original farmland that Iwan Iwan purchased when he came over as an immigrant in 1875 in that area of Iowa and farmed was no longer in the family. In fact, by 1890s, the, the first of the maps in here, he had already sold some of that property, and it was outside the family. You see, the bloodline doesn't count for as much as the words that are written in those deeds and in those wills. And so even though we can go back and, and claim our connection and ancestry back to Iwan Iwan, and, and we could probably even show that if we got the names right, it doesn't give us any claim on any of that farmland because it doesn't pass down that way. It passes down by deeds and wills, and that's what Jen's cousin was researching. So while we were invited there to come and sort of visit the farmland and to reminisce a little bit, we had no claim on it ourselves. Now I want you to listen to what Paul says about his kinsmen, the Israelites, in Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 4. He says, they are the Israelites. To them belongs the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is born the Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Verses 4 through 5. What Paul is saying is that all of the blessings that God has ever given were all given to you, my kinsmen. Every good thing that God ever had to give, whether it was the covenant, whether it was worship, whether it was the promises, they were all given to you. Not only so, but even God himself came and took his place in your ancestry, in your genealogy, when he came as the Christ. Forever praised. Amen, says Paul. They have all of these things. So then why, in chapter 9, verse 1, does Paul start out this part of the letter saying, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. Christ, my conscience bears witness in the spirit, and I have great sadness and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul has this unceasing anguish because none of those benefits are remaining in the family. You see, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, they had been tracking their genealogies, they've been making sure that their bloodline is pure, they've been following their ancestor all the way back to Abraham and made sure that connection was sound. And yet they had lost all of the blessings. None of them remained in the family. And, and this is what Paul's ministry has been about presenting. It's some of the first thing he presents to anybody of the Israelites' ancestry whenever he meets them. Jeremiah did a similar thing in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 32, was living at a time in which also the Israelites had lost all of the blessings. It was at a time when enemies were surrounding the city of Jerusalem, building siege works and ramps against its walls, and they were about ready to invade Jerusalem. And these enemies of the nation of Israel had already taken over all the surrounding territories, and they had confiscated the land and taken them away from their owners and given it to other people to own. And it was in the midst of this time that the same thing had happened to one of Jeremiah's uncles. Jeremiah's uncle lived in the territory of Benjamin. These invading armies had come in and confiscated his land and taken it away and left his uncle and his uncle's family destitute. And so bankrupt and struggling, Jeremiah's cousin came to him in Jerusalem and said, buy from me the field at Amathoth in the tribe of Benjamin, for it is your right to redeem it. And now that was a custom in Israel that if one of your relatives fell in hard times, if they were struggling financially, if they were in dire straits, one of the ways to help them was to buy a portion of their land. You would pay them for their land, and then you now, as the new owner of the land, you could make a profit off the land. You could farm the land, you could do business on the land, whatever you'd like to do. You get something back out of it, and then, after a number of years, when the Jubilee year comes, then you give it back to the original family. It's a way to help the family member out of debt. Except that Jeremiah didn't stand anything to gain out of this. Because that land that his cousin is trying to sell him has already been confiscated by foreign armies. Jeremiah is not going to get anything out of it if he pays his cousin for that land. Because it's already been given away to other owners. And yet, Jeremiah says, I know that this is the word of the Lord. 
And so Jeremiah weighs out the amount of silver that that land would cost and pays his cousin for the land and then signs all the deeds in the presence of the officials in the courtyard and takes those deeds and rolls them up in scrolls and puts them in a, in a jar of clay and seals that jar in place so they'll be there for years to come. Because as Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 32 verse 15, thus says the Lord of hosts, houses and vineyards and fields shall again be bought in this land. See, the problem with the people of Israel in Jeremiah's day is they had forgotten to hold on to the promises of God. Even up to this time, they had not been holding on to these promises. They had been instead wrapped up in their life of leisure and in their time of peace. They were excited about chasing after worldly amenities and all sorts of other stuff. And they thought that as long as we have this ancestral bloodline connection back to Abraham, then God's, five, God's favor will never depart from us. And it wasn't until the peace was taken away and their homes were being destroyed and all their land was being confiscated and everything was taken away from them that they began to wonder what happened to God's favor. Aren't we descendants of Abraham? And yet Jeremiah is telling them that it's not about being a descendant of Abraham. It's about holding on to the promises of our God. And so by buying this land, Jeremiah is showing them that hold on to the promises of God. Because what Jeremiah is telling them to hold on to is something that's been foundational since way back in the days of Abraham, and it was in Jeremiah's day, and it still is in Paul's day, and that's why Paul says it in our text for today, too. So in Romans chapter 9, Paul said, it is not the children of flesh who are considered the children of God, but it is the children of promise who are counted as offspring. Romans chapter 9, verse 8. It's not the children of the flesh who are considered children of God, but the promise. Children of the promise who are counted as offspring. So Jeremiah is holding fast to that promise of God. Even though he can't see it, he can't imagine how it's going to happen, but God has promised that someday fields will be bought and sold in this land again. And so banking on that promise, Jeremiah buys the field from his cousin. When we were traveling back to this reunion, at my wife's ancestral land, among her kinsmen in the flesh. We were also dealing with an issue that was going on back here at home. It was a leaking water heater. And we knew it was going on before we left. And so I had gone around to some of the chain hardware stores to see if I could find one that would go in and give us a bid for replacing it and see what it would cost, see if we could get that scheduled for as soon as we got back. And I found one that said, yeah, we'll do that, but um, we do have to charge you for that assessment. We'll charge you for the bid, but we'll come out We'll decide how much it's going to cost, decide what you need. And then when you buy it, if you buy it from us, we will credit that cost for the cost of the water heater when you purchase it. So you won't end up paying that cost. That was the word of the salesman. So I held on to that word. I took it as promise. And we had to come out and assess it. And then while we were gone, we got the news of what we were going to need. And I paid for it over the phone. And then when I got back and met with the installation office, found out that they had changed their policy. They said, we no longer refund that cost when it comes to water heaters. Maybe I should have known better. You've had to deal with bad deals like that before in the past, I'm sure. People who have gone back on their word of promise. Sometimes it makes us leery about accepting the word of other people. Sometimes it makes us weary about accepting the word of our God, too. And so if you were Jeremiah, in that situation, would you have bought the land from your cousin? If all you had to go on was a word from God that somewhere in the future that land would be of value at some point, again, would you trust in the word of God? See, sometimes it's hard for us. When, when we're presented with these things, when we're presented with the way of faith that says trust in the words of God, or when we're presented with the way of flesh that shows obvious security, it's hard for us to make that choice for the way of faith. When we're presented with the path of trust, or when we're presented with the path of something that we can see and know for certainty, it's hard to make that choice. Now, Jeremiah's cousin was asking him to help him with some land. Now, I don't know how often that happens to us, but if a relative of your family came to you and asked you for help in some way, and you knew that there's a good chance you're not going to get back anything you've invested in this? Would you trust in God to redeem that? Would you be willing to help? 
That's what Jeremiah's cousin says to him. He says, it is your right to redeem. Now, he's talking about redeeming the land because of that custom we told you before. But what if it's not land that needs to be redeemed? What if it's integrity? What if it's a relative who comes to you because of some mistakes that they've made in the family in the past, they've lost all their integrity with the rest of the family, and they're asking you to stand with them and support them in whatever they're going through. Are you willing to risk that for their sake? What if it's a relationship that they're asking you to redeem, a friendship that you once held, but it's now falling apart, and they're asking you to make a chance, take a chance at again? Are you willing to take that risk when... For all practical purposes, it seems like anything that you would put into that friendship or that relationship is a good chance of being lost. Jeremiah trusts in the word of the Lord. And he buys that property, not because he believes that he's going to be able to redeem it for his cousin, but he buys the property because he trusts that the Lord is able to redeem it. And that the Lord's going to make a change. And that someday, houses and fields will be bought and sold in this land again. Are we willing to trust that the Lord is able to redeem those situations. We may not trust that our ability to do it, that if we say, yeah, I'm going to invest in this, that it's really going to change, but we're willing to trust that God can redeem. Because God's given us a word of promise that says that he can. Paul says in this Romans text, beginning at verse 6, he says, not all were descended from Israel, Israel, and not all the children of, God, of Abraham are his children because they are his offspring. For it is through Isaac that your offspring shall be named. And this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. When we got back from our trip to Iowa, I visited with the installation office of the store that sold us the water heater. And it turned out that holding on to that promise of the salesman was the best thing that I could have done. Because not only did I have the promise of the salesman that said that they would credit this to our account, but I also went back and looked at my receipt a little more closely and found out that it was printed right there on the receipt, too, in ink, and they had printed it there. So then when I was visiting with the installation person, I showed him, I said, here's the promise right here, and that ended all discussion, because I had the words right there, they credited that back to me. And this is what Paul is telling us, this is what Jeremiah is telling us, he's telling us the bank everything we have on the Word of God. Because He has made promises to us, and not only that, but He has put these promises in writing for you and me. He's put in promise, the right, that that promise to redeem, He's put in writing for us. The promise that He can redeem even a relationship that for us, it said, seems like is lost. Even integrity, that for all practical purposes, sin has stolen and the enemy has taken away, that God says, I can redeem that. Not only say, I will redeem it, but he says, I have redeemed it. And so Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says that Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung upon a tree. This is so that the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles also through Christ Jesus. So they too might receive the promised spirit. That is the promise, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. That Jesus took the curse for us, and it's written as a promise for us that he would redeem us and all people. And that promise has a guarantee with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It says, it is God who has established you and I in Christ and anointed us and placed his seal upon us and gave his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. See, not only was Paul's proclamation just that the blessings had left his kinsmen of Israel because they were busy hanging on to their ancestry and let go of the promise, but the rest of his message was to carry this news that all people could be brought into this promise. And so when he was first called, he tells the story in Acts chapter 26, verse 17 and 18, and he says, Jesus himself sent him and said, go open eyes that are blind and turn people from darkness of light to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, so they might receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who have been sanctified by faith. That's the place you and I have received. <laughs> the place of forgiveness. The place among those who have been sanctified and so we don't trust or rely on our ancestry or our pedigree 
Although, I mean, even among people who claim to be Christians, you see that sometimes, don't you? I mean, you might talk to people and they say, Oh, my grandmother, she was a devout Lutheran. Or, oh, my grandfather, he was a pastor. Or so-and-so, and my cousin's a, just a strong Christian. Now, I know they don't necessarily mean it this way, but it almost sounds as if they believe that somehow that Christian faithfulness will be passed by natural descent directly to them. But we know that that's not true because that's not how inheritance works, at least not here in the United States. Inheritance passes by will and testament, right? Just like the farmland. So we have a testament. That's why we call this the testament, the Old and the New Testament. It is the testament and will of Christ Jesus for all the blessings of God to be passed on to us. But what counts in this testament is what's written in the Word. For us to hold on to that Word. That's why we're having Bible Day Camp this week. It's so that those people who come in from our community, the, the families in our community, the children in our community, they can come in and we can tell them what's in this testament. We can tell them these words and promises that God has made to them. And they hold fast to those words and promises of God. That's what Jeremiah was doing. That's why Jeremiah was willing to buy that field from his cousin. That's what Paul was doing when he is making this trip back to the land of his kinsmen. Because that was a step of faith. You know, he really wanted to start another mission journey and to go to Rome, beyond Rome, to Spain. And everybody kept telling him, don't go back to, to your own land. Don't go back to Israel. The Israelites want to arrest you. The Israelites want to kill you. You're not going to survive this. But Paul went anyway. He went. He went by faith. Because he had this compassion in his heart for his kinsmen in the flesh. And what happened when he got there? Well, he went into the temple to worship, and the Israelites arrested him. And it started a multi-year imprisonment that prevented him from ever going on that fourth mission journey, from probably ever reaching Spain, so far as we know. And yet, when you read the letter, letters of Paul, years later, when he was still in prison after this, Paul says, what happened to me really served to advance the gospel. What happened to me really served to advance the gospel because that imprisonment is what took him to Rome. That imprisonment allowed him to speak the gospel before kings and before emperors, and that imprisonment even ended up bringing some of the people in Caesar's own household to faith in Christ Jesus. You can read about it in the first chapter of Philippians if you want to. You see, when, when we are following the promises of our God by faith, it may not take us in the directions that we had planned for but it will serve to advance the gospel. And that's what really counts, right? In Jesus' name.